Good afternoon. So today we are going to discuss about conventional with profit policies and we'll be building up on what we already know from evaluation of assurances as well as annuities. And uh, under this particular lecture, you should be able to describe the operations of conventional with profit contracts as well as describe the benefits payable and the different types of assurance types by now incorporating the with profits aspect. And lastly, you should be able to develop the mean and the variance of the payments under the various assurance contracts. So we have been looking at um, the without profits contracts from our first lecture all the way to the second one, as well as the third one on the variable benefits contracts. And when we speak of without profit contracts, we're looking at uh, policies whose premium and benefits are actually fixed and guaranteed at the date of issue. So that if you purchase, let's say an endowment policy, which is a without profit endowment assurance policy, then from the very date of issue of the policy, the date at which the policy starts, then under this type of contract, the premium and the benefits will be specified. So by us saying that they are fixed, that does not necessarily mean that they are constant, but rather that you know them from the very outset. So you can still have an increasing uh, benefit, an increasing endowment assurance where the benefits will be increasing over the period, or we may also have a decreasing assurance where the benefit is decreasing over the period of the contract. So the converse of that, uh, what we refer to as the with profit contracts pol or policies, this now refers to benefits or policies under which the benefits and the premiums can vary um, from one year to the next. And this variation is attributed to the growth of the benefits when there's a surplus of assets or liabilities. So you'll find that under these types of contracts, the insurance company will take part of the premium and invest it so that over the years, as uh, the investment portfolio performs, uh, the years where the assets will outperform the liabilities, so that that surplus can be distributed to the policyholders in form of uh, losses. So, with profit contracts uh, work in such a way that the supplies must might be re used to reduce the premium payable for the same benefit, so that in that case the policyholder enjoys the reduction of premium, or the surplus can be distributed in form of an increased sum assured where the policyholder will continue to pay the same amount of premium, but the sum assured will be increased. So those are the two main ways, but we also have another way where the insurance company can actually choose to distribute the surplus in form of cash payments to the policyholders. So in this particular lecture, we shall focus on uh, the situation where surplus is actually distributed to the policyholder in form of increased sum assured benefits. So to help us understand this, well, let's consider this illustration. So consider a life insurance company deciding on a premium basis for an endowment assurance contract. So when we speak of a premium basis, we are simply looking at what set of assumptions must uh, must we uphold for us to determine the price? So we'll assume an interest rate, we'll assume a mortality basis. So for instance, we may price our endowment assurance contract assuming a 4% rate of interest. We may also assume our mortality follows that of the ELT 15 mil table or the AM92 uh, mortality tables. So that is what we mean by premium basis. Um, so you realize these premiums will be set 
under these assumptions. And this must be done before the contract is actually rolled out to the potential customers. So in future, you appreciate that the experience may not, the experience of let's say the interest rates may differ what, from what was actually assumed in the first place. So assuming we priced our contract at the rate of 2% per annum interest, and then five years down the line, uh, down the contract of our endowment assurance, our interest rate actually differs from what was experienced so that it fall, if it falls, it, if it falls below that 2%, let's say to 1%, then the, in that case, we expect that the company will, in most cases, actually make a loss from those particular policies. Conversely, if the rates over the term are significantly in excess of that initial assumption of 2%, then the policyholders will actually uh, feel that they have been uh, deprived or they have been overcharged for the benefit under which, which was originally priced at 2%. So that in that case, they will feel it is actually, uh, it was better for them to have deposited their monies probably in a savings account. So therefore it is, uh, so there's that balance that needs to be, needs to be struck. So this is how now the with profits uh, contracts come in. So in, in this, so with that regard, it only makes sense that the company assumes a low rate of interest when determining the premiums at the very outset of the contract. And this will give the initial sum assured so that once they receive these premiums, which have been priced at this low rate of interest, they can now invest a portion of it uh, so that it earns or it accumulates some surplus. And once they realize those surplus, uh, surplus of assets of liabilities, then they can distribute those bonuses to the policy holder. So they can distribute this policy to the policy holder, and this can take the form of increased, increased sum assured. So we are saying that we expect that we will make or we'll start our pricing based on a set of assumptions. And these assumptions as we move on within the contract, remember life, insure, life assurance contracts are actually long-term and not as opposed to general insurance contracts. So there will be deviations from what was actually assumed. And this can actually be to the benefit of the policyholder or to the disadvantage of the policyholder and in the same manner, it can also be an advantage to the insurance company or a disadvantage to the insurance company. So it is in both the company's interest as well as the policyholder's interest to ensure that uh, none actually, uh, both of them are actually, both of their needs are actually being met. So that in that case, we, we say that it's more prudent to price the contract or determine the premium at a low interest and then over the years distribute bonuses to the policyholders. Um, so that is now why this with profit contracts actually come in. So we shall focus on two uh, types of assurances and you'll find that uh, the approach in which we use to determine the expected present value is similar to that of um, the variable benefits types of contracts. So we shall see how we can modify our cash flows so that it resembles that of the variable benefit insurance contracts so that we are able to determine the EPV under the with profits types of contracts. So one type of with profit contract is an endowment assurance with bonuses added to the sum assured. And uh, so if you suppose that someone takes out a policy with a sum assured of 10,000, so this is the initial 
or the basic uh, sum assured as we know it from the without profit types of contracts. So if we assume that the, after the end of the first year, uh, the, the life office declares a bonus of 4% of the sum assured, what this means is that the new sum assured that is payable, the new sum assured that is payable at the end of the first year will no longer be 10,000, but rather 10,400. So, so it means if we, if we consider a life aged X, and we know that in an endowment assurance, we anticipate uh, our benefits to actually mature in two ways, either upon death of the policyholder or upon maturity of the term. So if we assume we are dealing with a five-year endowment assurance, if this policyholder dies between ages X and X plus one, then they're entitled to a sum assured of 10,000. But since, uh, so, so that's for the first year. But if they die between ages X plus one and X plus two, since they will have earned this particular bonus of 4%, it means that their beneficiaries will now be entitled to a sum assured of 10,400. Now, these bonuses, remember, are pegged on the surplus of assets over liabilities that the insurance company realize. So in the event that our assets are short of the liabilities, meaning that our assets are less than our, our liabilities, so that our investment return is actually negative, then in that case, the company is not likely to declare any bonuses. So we may have situations where uh, there are no bonuses declared. And in such a case, the sum assured will continue to remain as the initial basic sum assured plus any uh, bonuses that have accrued. So if we assume that between now, the end of year two, and year three, there are no more bonuses which have been declared, then our sum assured will still continue to be 10,400. So again, uh, this will continue on so that between, let's say, year four and five, another bonus of 4% is actually declared, then that bonus will be added to uh, our bonus of 10,400. So we shall now look at the various types of bonuses. Will our bonus be growing in a linear way or in an exponential way? And will we have a situation where we have different rates so that we have a, data, a rate applying for the, to the basic sum assured and another rate applying to the uh, accumulation of bonuses? So those are the variations which we shall look at and see how our new sum assured is uh, comes about under the with profits types of contracts. So this is uh, the various ways. So in determination of uh, or yeah, in determination of, of how these bonuses will be distributed, there are several things that need to be looked at, and the first one is what form the bonuses take. And uh, under this, we will have the simple uh, bonus rate, the compound bonus rate, as well as the super compound bonus rate. So we we'll look at each of them in, in detail and see how uh, each applies in reviewing our new sum assured. Then again, another aspect to consider when declaring the bonuses is what portion of the surplus the company distributes to the policyholder. So for instance, if the company experiences a surplus of 5%, will they distribute the entire 5% to the policyholders or will they retain, uh, let's say, a 2%? So that again is an element that needs to be looked at 
during the distribution of bonuses because you'll find situations where uh, an investment portfolio this year will perform so well and declare a surplus of five next year it may underperform and actually have a deficit so that in that case there's no surplus so there are those fluctuations associated with uh, with investments and therefore it may be prudent enough for our company to consider holding a portion of the surplus so as to smooth its cash flows so that our next point is uh, what degree of smoothing the company uh, operates so that in the if event if investment returns in one year are very good then they might choose not to distribute all the result, resultant surplus immediately but instead hold some back to compensate for poor investment returns in the in the future so another principle probably to consider during the uh, bonus distribution uh, is the the class or the allocation of their investment portfolio so that if a company has invested let's say in an equity market that is a stock market then they need to declare probably a bonus that reflects the performance within the equity market because we do not want a scenario where a, a policyholder feels I would rather have invested my money myself within the market. So those are the various components to consider. The form, the bonus takes, the portion of surplus to be actually distributed, the degree of smoothing the company operates in, as well as the investment strategy adopted by the company. So in our first objective, we mentioned uh, the reversionary and terminal bonuses. So these bonuses that we have talked of, this distribution of bonuses that we have talked of can be, can be applied or can be paid back to the policyholders in, at various points in time. So if we have these bonuses declared, let's say at the end of each policy, at the end of each year, not policy year, but at the end of each year, then we refer to that as refer reversionary bonuses. So these are bonuses which are paid on a regular uh, period or on, on a regular interval. And this regular interval can be every year, every two years, as long as it's a regular interval within the term of the contract. So we also have another form where the bonuses are paid at uh, at the point at which the policy matures and those are what we refer to as the terminal bonuses so these are the terminal bonuses which are allocated when the policy matures or becomes a, a claim so again it's at the discretion of the company to determine uh, which bonuses will actually be be paid and once a bonus is paid for instance if we speak of a reversionary bonus which is paid let's say on an annual basis, once it's declared, then it becomes part of your NISA assured and it is actually guaranteed and it cannot be uh, reviewed downwards. So we will now look at the various types of bonuses or how the bonus rates apply. And the first form is the simple, the simple bonus rate or the simple rate of bonus so this compares to what we tackled under fundamentals of actual mads one so where we looked at the simple interest and the compound interest and when we speak of the simple interest as we know it this is where the principal amount grows in a linear in a linear way so in the same same manner if our bonus rate is simple then it means that it is a uh, you will the, the the bonus will be a percentage of the initial basic sum assured. So that means over the years, if you'll have accrued bonuses, simple bonuses from year one to year two to three to four, any bonuses which is accrued is not actually does not continue to grow. So it remains a uh, constant from one year to the next. So that in that case we see that case we say that our our sum assured will is will increase in a linear 
in a linear manner over the policy term. Now, the next one is the compound, compound bonus rate. So under this rate, this is a percentage of the basic sum assured and bonuses that have been accrued in the past. So again, the difference between the two is that in this case, any bonuses which you have earned year on will also continue to earn bonuses. Yeah. So in this case, the sum assured is going to be growing exponentially. So by exponential, it means at the very earlier years of your contract, the growth will be small, but as you approach maturity of your policy, then the growth will be higher. So the last one, uh, what we refer to as the super compound rate. So as the name suggests, the, the name compound, this refers to a situation where we apply again the compound rate of bonus. The only difference is that in this case, we will now have two compound bonus rates. So we now have two compound bonus rates and one of the bonus rates shall apply to the basic sum assured, or else the second shall be applied to the accrued bonuses over the years. So again, uh, since we're dealing with compound, uh, rates, then they will still also be growing in an exponential, in an exponential rate. So we can look at a, at an example here. So the graph below shows the buildup of the sum assured over a lifetime of a 15-year policy with alternate with the following alternative methods, assuming as an initial sum assured of 10, 10,000. Uh, so if we consider this as our initial sum assured, let us see the, what will be the new sum assured benefit at the end of the first year, the second year, and the third year. So let's look at that before we review this graph. So if we consider that scenario, the first case is a simple interest of 5%, and our sum assured is actually 10,000. So we are applying the simple interest rate formula. We're under the simple interest rate formula. If you have a principal amount of an amount of P, then the accumulation within N time periods becomes P multiplied by the accumulation factor, which is given by one plus I times N. So in this case, our principal amount can be is, is compares to our sum assured. So this is now our, our principal amount. So our sum assured compares to the principal amount. So we are looking into accumulating our sum assured given the 5% rate of simple interest. So our accumulation factor becomes one plus my I, which is the interest rate in this case, is referring to the rate of bonus. So we have it as 5%. And my N, since we are looking at the corresponding sum assured at the end of the first year, then my N there becomes one. So that my accumulation factor simply reduces to 1.05. So my result here simply gives me the resultant new sum assured. So if we speak on, if we move on to year two, we are still have, we maintain our, our sum assured as our P. The accumulation factor is still one plus my I, which is in this case is still 5%, but now my N, since we are examining this as at time two, will now become two. So the accumulation factor, if you multiply uh, 5% times two, and you add that to one, then it becomes 1.1. .1. So this now becomes my new sum assured at the end of year two onwards. So that will continue on if you are assuming that uh, the rate of 5% five, 5 is actually applying for all the years. So that means we have been declaring reversionary bonuses of 5% uh, simple interest over 
over the heat. So that is uh, simple. So if you look at the next one, we had a compound, a compound rate of three points, a compound bonus rate of 3.9% again per annum. So if we do that accumulation in our first year, we are going to be applying the compound interest formula, which we have as P into the accumulation factor, where the accumulation factor is one plus I raised to N. So in this case, our I corresponds to the bonus rate, which is 3.9%. So, and our N is one. So my accumulation factor becomes 1.039 raised to one. So that by the end of the first year, my new sum assured under, under the reversionary compound rate of bonus of 3.9 is 10,390. So that if we move on to year two, we can tackle it in two ways. We can use the, now the new sum assured and apply the same compound rate of 3.9. So in this case, remember, under compound interest accrued in accrued bonuses, which in our case the accrued bonus from the first year is 390, also continues to earn interest. So we can tackle it using this equation. Conversely, we may apply uh, the accumulation factor given the compound rate, where we consider it to be uh, P into one plus I raised to N, and our N for year two becomes two. So that we'll have it as the basic sum assured times the accumulation factor of 1.039 all that raised to, to two. So that this now becomes my sum assured at the end of the second year. So and you progress on with the third year in the same, same manner. So if we go back to the third type of bonus, what we refer to as the super compound. So this is a situation where the basic sum assured earns a different rate of, uh, of bonus and the bonuses that have accrued over the years earn a different rate of bonus. So we will be applying 3% per annum on the basic sum assured, which is our 10,000 there. And then for any bonuses, which will have accrued from one year to the next, we will be applying 7.5%. So if you go back to our solution here, so in the first year, given that the policy was issued in year one, then there are no previous bonuses that have accrued. So our new sum assured will simply be the accumulation of the initial basic sum assured under, under the accumulation of 3% on it. So this gives me my new sum assured at the end of the first year. Now under the second year, our initial bonus will still grow at the same rate of 3%, but now the accumulated bonuses, and how, how do I determine my accumulated bonuses? I'll simply take the sum assured at the beginning of that year, which is marked by the sum assured at the end of the previous year. And from it, I subtract the initial sum assured. So this gives me the new or, or the accumulation of bonuses so far. And to these uh, bonuses, I will be applying the rate of 7.5%. So that gives me my new sum assured at the end of the second year. If we move on to the third year, then we'll still be applying 3% to our basic sum assured, then determine the accumulation of bonuses from uh, so far. And to that we'll be applying, or the bonuses will be growing at 7.5%. So we use the accumulation of 7.5%. So this becomes my new sum assured. So if you compare the bonus rates in the first year, we find that the simple compound is the highest across board. So if you compare that amount to that amount, to that amount, it, it is actually the highest 
and in the second year still the simple and a simple rate is still the highest across board in the third year again still the highest but you can see the gap the black the gaps between compound and simple are closing in so that over the years if you were to do that for all the 15 years and plot them in a graph then this is what you would observe so in earlier years you expect the simple to be higher to be higher as we move on compared to the compound as well as the super compound but even as we approach maturity then you'll find that uh, the super compound in this case are converging and they are higher than that than the simple rate of interest so it's again the discretion at the discretion of the company to determine which uh, rate of interest to actually apply or uh, attach to their policy so we let's now look at a, a scenario where we can now be able to evaluate the expected present value of our contract given a reversionary bonus so suppose so this is the example we're looking at suppose a life insurance company expects an investment return of 4.5 percent per annum on the assets backing it with profit policies over the foreseeable future so this is the return they are actually getting so the company wants to price its contracts to ensure that it can support reversionary bonuses so this is now our bonus rate per annum and the, and these bonuses are added at the start of each year using the simple distribution system for an endowment assurance issued to a life aged x with a term of n years and a sum assured of s payable at the end of the year of death then the premiums will need to meet a benefit with the epv of the following so this is what we are simply saying so the company is expecting uh, this is not what the investment is realizing but rather what the company is actually expecting in terms of their investment return so this is like the assumed uh, interest that they will use for their premium basis and they want to use this as their interest so that they're able to declare bonuses of two percent so we want to determine if this is now a contract where we are saying our premium basis of our four percent per annum interest rate and we are also including reversionary bonuses of two per two percent per annum what is now our expected present value for this n year endowment assurance with uh, some assured of an amount of s and the policy is actually issued to a life age x so we want to compute the epv with the new element of our cash flow which is a reversionary bonus of two percent so you realize if we declare if you assume for instance let's assume that our sum assured here is ten thousand so if you take two percent of that ten thousand that gives us 200 shillings so it means that in the first year so we're told that they added at the start of each year so at the start of each year so it means that when this life was aged x then the sum assured had a bonus of 200. if they survive to hx plus one then it means that our new uh sum assured will be uh increased by now 400 yeah so that will continue so we'll have if you were to consider the cash flow for this reversionary bonuses from one year to the next we'll have 200 at the start of the first year 400 at the start of second year uh, 600 at the start of the third year and so on so we can now consider 
in evaluation of our EPV, we can consider our cash flow to be composed of two, two things. Our, our first one to be of level payments of the sum assured, where we expect an amount of S at, uh, that is payable at the end of the year of death, which is constant. So if death occurs between ages X and X plus one, we expect a sum assured of S. If uh, death occurs between X plus 10 and X plus 11, we still anticipate a sum assured of an amount of S. So that gives me, uh, that's my level cash flow. The other cash flow will now be the cash flow of this additional reversionary bonuses of 2% per annum. So remember the bonuses, once they're added, they will uh, they will remain. So in the first case, they will be entitled to 200. So that will remain. In the second year, they will still be a 2% per annum. So it will be so. Uh, so if you add to the new 200 for that year and the previous 200, in that case, the amount there is actually 400. So it means that in this case, we can consider this cash flow of reversionary bonuses to be actually an increasing benefits uh, type of cash flow. So that when we are now evaluating our EPV, we will now consider it to be the sum of the expected present value of our fixed payments of S and that of the increasing benefits pegged on the bonuses. So that our EPV for the level will be given by S times the EPV for a unit uh, sum assured. In this case, we are referring to an endowment type of contract. So we'll have this as our uh, expected present value and we multiply that with the corresponding sum assured. And now for the increasing part, we will determine by how much uh, are our increasing payments or increasing bonuses, so it will be 2% of the sum assured, and we will now be considering our discounting factor to be uh, to be that of the increasing endowment assurance. So that if we were looking at this question, if our question was, um, so for a, for a whole life assurance issued to a life aged X, and a sum assured of S payable at the end of the year of death, then our expected present value would be S A X without the angle N, plus again the 2% of the sum assured with, multiply that with increasing whole life assurance. So we'll have I A X without again the angle N. And our rate of interest is the 4.5%. So we can look at a question. So give an expression for the expected present value of the benefits provided by a with profit endowment assurance policy, life aged X with a sum assured of S payable in any year's time or at the end of the year of death. So we assume that the compound reversionary bonus, so in this case we're looking at compound, is of 2% per annum and it is declared at the start of each year with an interest rate of 4.5 per annum effective. So our new, our bonus rate is 2% and our interest, our premium basis, our interest rate is 4.5%. So we need to determine how does our cash flow sit. So we already know that with an endowment assurance type of contract, then our benefit of the sum assured of S is payable either on maturity, that is, when the policyholder survives to age N or on earlier death. So this person aged X can die within the first year. So meaning that they will die between ages X and X plus one or 
they can die in the second year, that is between ages x plus 1 and x plus 2, so that we have that. Again, that can continue between ages x plus 2 and x plus 3, all the way to the period of between ages x plus n minus 1 and h x plus n. So if we consider uh, those likelihoods, then we need to ask ourselves, if they died within their first year, for instance, how much would be the sum assured? So we go back to our question. So our question says, uh, so, is, so give an expression of the expected present value of benefits provided by a with profit endowment assurance issued to a life aged X with the sum assured of S. So the sum assured is S and this is payable in any year's time. And we're assuming a compound a reversionary bonus of 2% per annum declared at the start of each year. So if we have this bonus declared at the start of each year, it means that if this life died between ages X and X plus one, then they will be entitled to a benefit of S plus 2% of S. So which gives me my new sum assured as 1.02 of S. So this is my new payable sum assured if the policy holder dies between ages X and X plus one. So to determine the present value of that, I need to discount that by one year, since we are already looking at this as at the end of the first policy year, that is between ages X and X plus one, given that the policy was issued at age X, then it means that uh, this amount, this amount's present value is actually the amount itself times the V for one, yeah, so our power there is simply one year. So this, the product of the amount and V gives me the present value. So if we now want to obtain the expected present value, we now uh, include the element of probability. So we expect to pay this present value if and only if this life it x dies between ages x and x plus one. So we must include this mortality probability. So we do the same for year two. So again, we're still having the reversionary bonuses of 2% being declared at the start of each year. So it means that at uh, as at the end of the second year, our new sum assured will be one plus the bonus rate squared times my sum assured. And since this is now looking at it as at the end of the second policy year, my discounting factor will be V squared. And this is only payable if they survive their first year and die within their second year. So it is marked by this deferred mortality probability. So this means that we're looking at a scenario where the person or the policyholder survived from age X to X plus one, and died between ages x plus one and x plus two, which is when this amount is expected to be actually paid. So that continues on up to the last period and the last period pegged on, uh, on our sum assured maturing by death is between ages x plus n minus one and x plus n before they attain H X plus N. So our new sum assured will be, remember this reversionary bonus are being declared at the, at the beginning of the year. So in that case, our amount becomes one plus the bonus rate raised to N times S. We discount that to obtain the present value. And so that we obtain the expected present value, we multiply that with the deferred mortality probability. So our expression from this point all the way to our first term there. So what I'm circling right now simply corresponds to the death benefit. 
So we also know that the benefit is still payable upon maturity. So once they get to age X plus N, the amount of sum assured payable will still be 1.0 to power N times S. Yeah. And we will need to discount that again to time N. And this is again payable if they survive from age X to age X plus N. So this amount here will still be one. So you can see this, our, our amount here is the same as our amount uh, at this point. And why we have it as so is simply because these bonuses are added or declared at the start of the year. So at the start of year N minus uh, year N, then we had this as the amount that was declared. So we cannot have it as n plus one because that will now mark uh, uh, that will mark a period which is beyond the policy year. Remember, this is an n year endowment assurance, and therefore we cannot have n plus one. So this is our sum assured at maturity, which is marked at as at time x plus n. So this becomes our cash flow, and from here we can now simplify our cash flow so that we now evaluate our EPV. So we can now substitute for our V there, since we already are given the rate of interest as, as 4%. So in substituting, we have our expression here. So all that has been done here is substituting for V or expressing V in terms of I, and we can factor out the S, the S is common throughout. So we can factor out our S, which is the sum assured, so that we now have our expression here. So if you look at these terms, they compare to now another function of V, or another function of the discounting factor, which we can simply uh, denote by V prime. So this is V prime, V prime squared, V prime to power N, V prime to power N. So that we can now have our expression simplified uh, in this form. So if you look at this expression, this simply is the expected present value of an endowment assurance issued to a life aged X that is lasting for a period of n years, only that in this case, we'll be evaluating this EPV at a rate of interest I prime, where our I prime should be such that if you express your V, it should be giving you your V equal to this particular ratio. So we are saying in this case that uh, if this is our V there, which is given by this uh, expression. And if you simplify it further, it becomes one over 1.0245. Then you're looking for a new rate of interest, our I prime, such that if you compute your V given the I prime, it will give you this value. So to be able to determine your I, you're simply going to be quoting uh, this one plus 1.0245 negative 1 to be equal to 1 plus your I prime raised to negative 1 so that you make your I prime the, the subject. And once you do so, then this becomes your, your value. So our EPV there simply becomes the expected present value. It should be equal to your S times a x angle n now being computed at i prime which is 2.45 instead of the original rate of 4.5 so you can see once you're able to evaluate your equation of value pegged on how the assurance works and how your compound or your interest or your reversionary bonuses are being accrued, then the rest is simply uh, borrowing from your previous knowledge on variable benefits.
So once you get it right at this stage, then the rest becomes uh, simple. So after this video, attempt the quiz. That is the only way uh, I will mark that you have actually come for this particular lecture. So ensure you complete the, vid uh, the quiz within um, the lecture hours. So you can also, also post questions in the chat room so that I'll be able to see them.